welcome to the National World War II Museum's podcast series, Service on Celluloid. This podcast is brought to you through the generous support of the Albert and Ethel Hertzstein Charitable Foundation. Each week, our in-house experts sit down with special guests to discuss depictions of World War II on film. Sit back and get ready for a lively debate that will reveal the good and bad of how Hollywood shows the 20th century's most dramatic event. My name is Seth Paradin, historian and digital content manager here at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. And our special guests for today's episode are Dr. Rob Satino, senior historian here at the museum. Hello, Seth. Chrissy Gregg, assistant director of distance learning at the museum. Hey, everybody. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Marcus Cox, professor of history at Xavier University here in New Orleans. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Today we'll be doing something a little bit different in that we're not discussing a, quote, Hollywood film, but a documentary. We'll be discussing the 1944 film The Negro Soldier. Produced at the behest of the War Department, The Negro Soldier is a call to arms for African Americans across the country. It is a prideful piece that shows the accomplishments of African Americans not only in the military, but also in science, society, and the arts, and made at a time in American history when African Americans were certainly not treated as equals which is one reason why the film is still important to this day. Told through, generally through narration, the film doesn't really star anyone, but does feature the likes of Jesse Owens, Benjamin Davis, George Washington Carver, and Carlton Moss. The film is directed by Stuart Heisler, produced by the great Frank Capra, and distributed by the War Activities Committee. It received wide praise upon release, and has since been deemed, quote, culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant, end quote, by the United States Library of Congress, and selected for preservation, and the National Film Registry. So as we do with all of these, and Rob, I'm going to start with you because you're sitting next to me and you're a veteran of this podcast. I sure am, so. Although this is kind of an odd question for a documentary, I'm going to ask it anyway. How accurate is this film? Hmm. You have to look at accuracy, I think, Seth, on a number of different levels. This is probably going to be the frame for most of what we're going to be talking about today. It shows that African Americans have been embedded in the history of the United States from the beginning. In fact, from, since before there was a United States, they took part in every single conflict and every single major development in American history. So, you know, props for that. Uh, there are huge gaps in the historical record um, in this film. Uh, slavery just hap- does not happen to be mentioned in the course of the Negro Soldier. It does not. Uh, neither, the Civil War is fought for reasons that apparently nobody really knows because they're not discussed. There's no Reconstruction. There's no Jim Crow. There's no segregation. You know, there's there's there, there's none of that. Um, t- to be fair, uh, Capra was making a film within a very some certain very narrow constraints about what he could and could not say. So he had a, a relatively narrow charge, something he was trying to do in this film. And I think in that sense, I think he did it successfully. Dr. Cox, what about you? What's your opinion? I agree. I agree with Rob as always. Uh, <laughs> Good, Marcus. Thanks. But but, but really, noted. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 the one of the things that stood out to me was you know what is missing, and um, and, uh, and and I realized that that the movie was was essentially made to um, as a recruitment tool. Um, and specifically for black soldiers. It also was made to uh, demonstrate um, black uh, patriotism, which was called into question throughout the war. Um, So from those standpoints, I think um, it was successful. Um, But on the other hand, um, I realize that um, there's a lot that the movie, that the documentary is not saying, and there were very strict parameters in terms of what they could um, uh, uh, reflect in terms of uh, African Americans in the United States and their experience. Um, so you don't necessarily want to talk about racial ra- race riots and controversial issues and those things that would call into question either black patriotism, but also uh, racial equality and liberty, justice, all of those you know American principles. Chrissy, what's your opinion? Yeah, for me, it was really hard to watch this film, like, not with a 2020, like, mindset or lens. Um, and kind of having to step back and, like, analyze it after um, I watched it, you know, then I, be- I came to appreciate it more and more. But, yeah, the discussion we had actually before we started um, – rolling tape here uh i I feel exactly the same as dr cox that like there's so much that was not said that i wish it would have just even touched on and and certain things i was thinking like the double victory campaign which in some ways you know and again from a 2020 lens is so not controversial but i'm sure back then to put something like that in a in a film 
Right. I'm sure it was. So, right. uh, yeah, it was. I, I had an initial reaction after I watched it about its accuracy, and then I kind of changed how I felt about it in the days after I watched it, which is really interesting. So, yeah, I, I, I got to say, I. I kind of agree with everybody here and that it's 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 hard to judge the accuracy of a documentary because I mean documentaries by nature are supposed to be obviously true stories and this is a true story to a point but it does as everybody said here it leaves a lot out and to your point Marcus is is that you know this was made to raise morale right <laughs> not not no, lower not, morale. Exactly. Which I mean, to be fair, if they would have covered everything like you were saying, slavery and and race riots and uh, Jim Crow and oh, a myriad of other things, right? It would not have been the recruiting tool that it was in, in, de- designed to be, right? And there was a fear that um, if this if this documentary was received poorly, you know, I guess to put it that way, that there would there could be. Um, race riots, there could be violence, there could be repercussions. Um, so it's interesting, you know, you know I, I've used this video many times when I was teaching at the Citadel Military College, and I would always tell my students to n- not focus so much on what the video was saying, but what is it leaving out? Because I, I would use that as a teaching tool. But the interesting thing about it is, up until this particular point, not even the U.S. military really acknowledged those contributions that African Americans made militarily. Mm-hmm. So for African Americans and people in the, in the black community, they were, very, um, they were very excited. They were very happy to see that acknowledgement, you know, not only from, from a federal, the federal government, but, um, um, but in, in, in terms of um, um, c- civilian leadership and that sort of thing. So from that standpoint, it was very successful and it was very well received in the community. Yep. So, you know, C- Capra got a list of, of what he was allowed to say and, and not say. So they put some sociologists to work and drew up lists of what would be appropriate. And, you know, when we think of, gee, this, this film is, in terms of our understanding of race relations, this film is 70 years out of date. Right? I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll all agree with that. But some of the things he was told, you know, um, was don't, don't have watermelon seeds. No stereotypical uh, African American behavior that was a typical of so-called Negro pictures of the time. Um, Capra tells a story in, in his uh, uh, memoirs about premiering this film in front of a bunch of African American journalists and all the great black press uh, 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 figures were there, and, and they all said the same thing: "You're going to show this to white people," and it was amazing. It seemed it was a, it was a, it was a view of, of dignity of of heroism, woman stands up in church and the whole thing takes place in church, the, like the beating heart of the black community. Right. And, yeah. and she says, my boy's in the infantry. You know, she's well-dressed. She's completely middle class, you can imagine. They show her son. He's, he's handsome. They look like a, a middle class Hollywood American family. And that's what Hollywood's always sold. They just, they, they had a pretty narrow bandwidth about how they sold it. But here, they had decided to let African Americans into the tent because all hands had to be on deck for this great global war that we were fighting. So I, I Again, I, you know, we, we can we can look at this movie and, and sometimes just roll your eyes and you just wanted to walk away from it. Um, but but at the same time, from a historical lens, if you're putting ourselves into where we were at the time, this film does have some things to recommend it. Well, you mentioned uh, you mentioned specifically, you know, all hands on deck, if you will. And Marcus, you you addressed this briefly when we when, when you made your opening remarks. The, but let's get to it. The film is. A recruiting tool. It doesn't appear to be, or it is a recruiting tool more than a propaganda piece. Because a lot of wartime documentaries, <laughs> let's be honest, ninety nine percent of wartime documentaries were that they were propaganda pieces. I mean, so you could make an argument that some of them were kind of both, mm-hmm. but this is without a doubt. This is a recruiting tool. And uh, why do you think the War Department made this film specifically? What, what, what do you think? What's your opinion? It's it's interesting, and I think well. I think when it when it, it was first discussed and it was first, um, of course, you, um, you go through the, you know, who you, who's going to direct it, who's going to write it. You know, the whole process or the production, I think it started in 1942, which was still at a point where um, it, it wasn't clear that the allies were going to win, win the war. Right. Um, and of course, obviously, it's released in 1944 when it's probably at that point where, where the, the tide has sort of swung in the favor of the allies. So I think there was an interest of um, recruiting more African-Americans for military service, um, improving morale in the black community. Of course, in 1943, you have a, a series of race riots, um, I think, in Harlem and Detroit. Um, and so, you know, it is important to the federal government to to get all hands on deck. It is important to get uh, support for the war. Um, and um, and and I think that um, the unintentional outcome was that it really 
promoted and sort of encouraged the civil rights movement in many ways. Um, uh, the, and the, the film or the war? No, the film. Okay. The, the, the film, because I think what, what the war did also, sure, uh, yeah. obviously, but the, but the film did because I think um, what it did it showed that African Americans have been a part of the American fabric throughout history. Sure, they've contributed in many many ways. Uh, the film documented all those contributions, um, and it only em- and empowered African Americans to ask for 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 equality and and civil rights um, based on those contributions. Again. Again, what I took from it, and what you know, many there were many valuable you know things, but one was that now there's there's I guess official acknowledgement of those contributions, which you never really saw and and read you know prior to that particular point. But you, Rob, what do you what do you think about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to second what Marcus said because I always agree with Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a love fest around this. Um, I, I think, you know, you make a movie for a purpose, and I agree. I think this film was made as a recruiting tool to make, to make sure that there was support for the war effort in the African-American community. At, at the same time, there's uh, unintended consequences. And, and uh, African-American uh, reviewers, uh, uh, journalists who saw this film really got behind it because they said, you know what? This this shows African-Americans in a dignified way, not the way we, we tended to be treated by Hollywood. Civil rights uh, folks today, even today, complain about the way the African-American community is treated by Hollywood. You know, public enemy as burn Hollywood burn a, a track I listen to all the time so w- what happens here is a film that's made for a wartime purpose also becomes a real benefit to the to the civil rights movement and you know the entire uh, so, so-called Negro press at the time the Pittsburgh Courier and the Amsterdam News in New York and the Defender Langston Hughes uh, the great firebrand and the Defender saying this film's worth its weight in gold so it's funny that we're sitting around talking about saying Oof, some, some of this was kind of embarrassing to watch but you know it all depends wh- where you stand it happens to be where you're sitting and, and if you were alive at the time this movie could come as quite a shock to you but, but we would all agree I hope around this table a shock in a good way I think you know yes I, and, and I, don't, I don't know if it's necessarily I mean you got to consider that you, you say there's some things that are embarrassing yeah, maybe, maybe to a point today but when they were made they were not you know and, and well, maybe, maybe they were to some people I shouldn't say that maybe it was but the point was is that the vast majority and I know we'll get to this later but I'm just going to say it now the vast majority of whites who saw this film were overwhelmingly positive right, right. Now, I, I do, you know, being from the South, I have to question where exactly they took those polls. And I'm not trying to be a smart ass and I'm not right. trying to be snarky, no. but I'm being no. serious. No. You know, if you ask somebody in Atlanta what they thought of that film, as opposed to, I don't know, Cleveland, right. you know, I think the answer is going to be significantly different. Right. Which, you know, I mean, you see that all the way through the 19th, hell, all the way to the 1970s, really. I mean, to be right. perfectly honest, it, even today. But but it's it's, you know. I think the fact the, the fact that it is a recruiting tool cannot be understated because you know there's a lot of documentaries as I said you know a lot of them are propaganda but there's a few that are recruiting tools too you know like with the Marines at Tarawa comes to mind it, you know I mean that's you know it opens with the halls of Montezuma and it closes <laughs> with the halls of Montezuma and anybody who doesn't isn't in the Marine Corps you're gonna you're gonna be first in line because you see this <laughs> you can't lose with the halls of Montezuma you, so. well no you can't but I mean you know if you're not in the Corps after you see this movie you can go wow man I'm joining the Marines and that's similar to what this is it gives young African Americans who are sitting there going they don't want me to go, well, yeah, actually we do. And, and this is why, because you are not what society tells you. This is what you actually have done or your people have actually done. And this is what you can do. And we do need you. And because this is your country, too. And, you know, it, we're all in this. So hook up. I, I Let's go. The other thing I was thinking, too, in this conversation and um, before this is that um, – I think it shows maybe the very slow evolution of either the federal government and the U.S. military from, um, you know, I think about that 1925 study that we cite in Fighting for the Right to Fight that was used like Negro manpower in the war. And that was their recommendation on the basis, you know, for the um, um, for the war uh, um, department. And then we see a film that initially yeah, is d- in 1942 that they decide to make it but I think by 44 it's um, kind of taken on a whole new life in that it's not just shown in um, recruiting centers where African American soldiers are coming in sailors and it's everyone it's, it's then eventually shown to everyone and so by like 44 I'm thinking about like there are, there are things that transpire between 42 and 44 within race relations so I'm thinking about like the Port Chicago disaster so like so minds are hopefully very, very slowly changing 
Um, and I feel like you see the evolution in in maybe that even that sh- very short time period where this film was produced. You know, I want to so. say a word in favor of propaganda. Since we, we, we've used prop, the word propaganda a couple times, and it, it works, it, it has a negative spin. You know, propaganda is, is is bad, but really, propaganda is a piece that is meant to persuade somebody, right? Sure. And and so, you know, Marcus, we're talking about forty two to forty four, forty two when the film's conceived. War situation is pretty dicey. By forty four, well, it's no no longer so dicey. But something else was happening by forty four, and that's manpower shortages that's across what I was across the say. board. Sorry, son, you're in my head. <laughs> I'm in your head as always, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, we had the United States had made a decision to devote a great amount of its manpower to, to, to the factory as opposed to the front line. And that was leading to very serious problems by late 44 and early 45. So manpower is needed all along the line. And um, all hands on deck. You know, she's that nautical phrase and, again. Everybody was needed. Everybody was necessary. And, and that's exactly what I was going to say is that, you know, why wasn't this, per, this film produced, you know, in the months right after Pearl Harbor? Because while we had taken casualties, we hadn't taken massive casualties yet. But by 1944, we had. We'd, we were in, we'd gone to North Africa. We'd gone through Sicily. We were still in Italy. We were in France. The Army Air Forces is getting the bejesus shot out of it over, over Europe. You know, the, the, the Navy and the Marine Corps are bleeding themselves white in the Pacific. We needed everybody who could fire a weapon. And so while the film is good and, and it is fantastic, frankly, and, and it is certainly worthy of, of all the praise that we're heaping upon it, being the cynic that I am, I have to wonder if there was an ulterior motive by the United States government. It's like, hey, you know, we need every single red-blooded American that we can get, and we need to boost this particular uh, area of recruitment. Let's do this now. That's a demographic. You know, you yeah. can't you can't De- waste a demographic. demographic. Thank you. That was the never, term. Never I was waste a demographic. For. And here's yeah. a huge demographic of able-bodied men. Yeah. Up till now, our ridiculous uh, racial b- policies of segregation have prevented from from getting to the front line. And, and it's asinine. I, That's I, what it is. Seth, you, you you said the great metaphor. We were blood white. So it's time to recruit blacks. You know, I mean, if, if, if you look at it in, in that way, I often think of that. Actively me- recruit them. I, I, actively recruit them, not just as stu- mess stewards or yep. servants, but as gun-toting, Mustang-flying, red-blooded American warriors. Well, I mean, look at, look at the combat service of, of African, Amer- African American units. When do they really see the hardcore combat that they do in the war? Late 1944 to 45. Right. That's when the 92nd gets in. I mean, they they were in Italy before, but that's when they really get into the fight. When they're up there, they're bleeding themselves white. You know, they're getting pounded in Italy, and the 332nd is losing people. You know, and then you got the 93rd in the Pacific. They're losing people. And, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it— it's all later, later in the war. But, but you know, what's interesting about this, and I guess, you know, looking at the, the use of African-American soldiers um, throughout American history, mm-hmm. um, the timing is not um, a shock. Um, when you look at the American Revolutionary War, but, you know, soldiers of color are not really used until um, they're used in the very beginning. But in terms of combat, there's they're they they're not called upon in, in large, large numbers. Um, certainly, you see that clearly during the Civil, civil War um, in terms of as a matter of fact, I'm reviewing a book right now um, about the uh, um, first um South Carolina violent volunteers um, and how they were used um, throughout the war and how um, Abraham Lincoln didn't authorize their use until after 1863, although there were calls before. But again, in the, at the beginning of the war, the Union's not doing so well. And so, um, so you know, throughout American history, African-American soldiers are called upon um, when thing not at the initial you know beginning of the in, in conflicts. In other words, because if you if you utilize them too soon, what's going to happen is you you're going to impact society societal norms. You're going to impact race relations and all those sort of things. So um, using utilizing and calling upon African American soldiers at a latter part of the stages of the war is really the norm. Um, but um, and again, like I said, it's a recruiting tool. However, um, there, are, if you you know look at the the, the documentary, you see African Americans not only uh, as soldiers, but you see them in the war industry. You see them in many areas that are really important to uh, winning the war. Um, and and um, uh, and and, vo- and uh, African American volunteers. Um, so um, you know, from that standpoint, I I, I wasn't really surprised um, um, that that 
the, the black experience is, re, is reflected in this very patriotic way. The interesting thing about it is African Americans and black leaders at this time are, are, are asking for more roles. They're asking to be involved. They're asking to get, to get uh, access to the industries. Um, and there's a reluctance by the federal government to do that. Um, so again, it, it just reflects the urgency of, of the day. Um, but one thing I do want to say, um, as it relates to, um, you, you know, u- utilizing African-Americans um, and then certainly the, the unintentional outcome and how this impacted the civil rights movement. Um, when you look at the desegregation of the military in 1948, you know, and I've often would lecture to my students, it, it sounds very romantic and, and nice to say that the military sort of woke up or the federal government and said that segregation is wrong and we're going to do this for the right reasons. But in actuality, segregation is prompted by the need for military efficiency and having um, training camps here for whites, training camps here for blacks, um, and being able to really prepare for the next war the co- um, with the Russians. Because I would often tell my students that the idea for many people was it wasn't if we're going to fight the Russians, it was when we were going to do it. And so uh, the military now is deciding to become more efficient, to be more lean, and segregation is part of that. Um, so um, I, um, I think that, again, this video or this documentary and asking um, or trying to get more support from the black community is also a part of the, the urgency, the efficiency of the military um, and with, for the purpose of winning the war, not to overturn racial and social norms. Even though it sounds nice to say that <laughs> it, it, it is, it is very nice and romantic. You're shattering to say it, but, all my illusions here, <laughs> right, but but I think I think we can all agree that that right. was that was the real reason that it was done. So, producer Frank Capra chose to tell the story in a church. Do you think this was a good decision? And if so, yes. Or <laughs> if so, yes. If so, why? And if not, right. why? Right. I, I think it's very intentional. And I think that, you know, one, one of the goals, I think, um, um, was to d- demonstrate black patriotism, but also uh, reflect African-Americans at, the, at their best. And so, of course, um, you know, church is where people um, tend to get dressed up. It's usually a very um, dignified setting. Um, um, and, and of course, when I would tell my students, you know, what is it not showing you're not showing poverty. You're not showing stereotypical behavior, whether it's real or imagined. Um, uh, it, it, it reflects the best of the black community. It's, 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 the, it's the middle class values um, in, a, in a very, um, uh, I guess. Um, All American setting. Yes, exactly. That's yeah. what I'm looking for. All American setting because that's who we are as a nation. We go to church. We worship God. Um, and um, we're hardworking, all of those, those American values. And I, and I think and it really when you really think about it, where else could you really sort of highlight the community in a different setting that you get that same yeah. you know, um, response, so to speak? It's, it's, very, it's very Frank Capra. If, if, if you've seen any of his other documentaries, and I know we all have, or his movies, yeah. and I know we all have done that too, uh, it's very Frank Capra. If you go back to why we fight, right? I forget which exact episode it is, but he describes. <laughs> you just quoted the thing. Right. He describes the American people as a church-going people, as a hardworking people. It's as episode a, one. It's the first of the. It's the first of the why we fight. It's prelude it's, to war. It, it's yeah. very, yeah. you know, it's very blueberry apple pie. Mm-hmm. And I mean, and, and let's be honest, in the 1930s, 40s and 50s, this was a, a very spiritual, much, right. much more than it is today. So, I mean, I don't find it necessarily foreign that he chose to, to set it there. I think I agree with you I, is what I'm very long winded in saying. I think he did it on purpose, obviously, that he shot it there. But it, there was a very strict reason behind why he did that. Yeah, I also I like it how it opens up, too, because it doesn't just show one church. It, it kind of dissolves into right. churches all across the country. Right. So showing that this is not a you, this is not unique even right. in this particular setting. This is something that you would see everywhere. 
and this is something that's universal no matter your skin color, this idea of something, a place that is sacred, a place to worship, you know? So initially I was like, oh, what, what? And then again, it's like, get out of your 2020 <laughs> head and like take it, right. take it a uh, step back. Now, when I, uh, when I see the church, uh, uh, I'll, I'll put it back in the terms of social class, Marcus. I think you kind of hinted at that too. This is solid middle-class American values, which up till now, you had to really be white to be considered part of that solid American right. middle-class, but at least for the 40 two minutes or whatever it is that we're watching the uh, the Negro soldier, you know, clearly African-Americans have been in, uh, have been uh, invited into the middle class, well-dressed, good looking, all out of central casting. The, there's a woman who says, I'm a PFC first class. The preacher says, first class indeed. Right. <laughs> it's like, it's like, well, there, I mean, it's not really, you know, it's, every movie has to have some moments of levity and that's the moment of levity in uh, in the Negro soldier. But I really do, I think that's important as well. I, I, clearly, the, the, the church has always been a center of African-American culture and African-American community. I think that's crucial here too but it's a it's the kind of church we're talking about it's obviously a m- middle class everybody's well dressed everybody's serious good americans well uh, a, a young african american right we i mentioned him earlier named uh, carlton moss helped uh, capper write the script why do you think he chose him chrissy what's 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 your opinion on that um well yeah i actually did a little research i kind of did some research on Carlton Moss, as we talked about on, you know, when we research this film, there's not a lot um, necessarily on the, like, widespread internet, but uh, I, I dug in a little bit to his story, and I just thought it was really interesting, and I thought we could mention here, is that he only agreed to make this film um, if a second film was made that talked about the virtues of an integrated military, and that film was called Teamwork, and I just I was so impressed that he was able to advocate for that, and it actually then happened in that time, you know, so... Um, and the rest of his career is is fascinating. He's he's a pioneer who's you know s- stuck up for everything that he believed in, and um, so he was just kind of an inspirational person. Oh, so just for the yeah. record, Carlton actually plays the preacher in the film yes. too. Oh, so he, too. he wrote yes. he wrote it, but he also <laughs> plays the preacher. So I'm uh, just to give you a little quote from Frank Capra's memoirs here. Frank said working with Carlton wasn't easy. He was my scriptwriter, researcher, and technical advisor. Moss wore his blackness as conspicuously as a bandaged head. Time and again, he would write a scene, then I'd rewrite it, eliminating angry fervor. He'd object, and I would explain that when something's red hot, the blowtorch of passion only louses up its glow, Copper said. So, look, Carlton Moss is is not a bit player. He wrote it, and he is the star of the film, and he came with a pretty good head of steam about what he wanted to say. And even if Capra was able to kind of dissipate that head of steam, you know, you make the initial you make the initial statement, and then they talk you down a little bit, but you're, you're still further along than you would be otherwise. So, you know, hats off to Carlton Moss. I really didn't know much about his post-war career, Chrissy, but uh, that's the that's the reference to him that uh, the, the description of him that Capra gives. And 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 I and I, I agree obviously, and I, um and I did just very you know sort of light uh, research also. But you know you know off the top of my head, um. The first thing that that I sort of thought was, I mean, it, it made sense to get um, an African American writer or technical um, advisor um, to talk about the black community um, in ways that that someone outside of the community may, either wouldn't understand. Keep in mind, you know, th- there's still a lot of speculation of how the black community is going to receive this this documentary. Is it going to is it going to be well received? Are people going to be angry? Could it backfire? Um, and so ha- having someone from the community, but someone who can maybe articulate some of the um, the concerns or, or even um, um, things that people consider to be really important would be important in terms of making the, um, uh, the video. So um, uh, now I do know that, you know, after doing research that quite a few things were sort of cut out of, of, of the, the, the final cut, so to speak. Um, because obviously the, the the studio is going to review it. They might make some changes. It went to, if I'm not mistaken, the War Department. They they you know made some changes or whatever, um, which is somewhat natural. But I think that um, I mean th- this individual is well educated. Um, he's already working, I think, in the theater uh, production department for the War Department. Um, and so it, it sounds like it was very natural to have someone like himself who sounded, you know, and I'm sure he was thinking this is a, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. You know, African Americans up to this particular point are primarily are reflected in, in the film industry uh, for comic relief and stereotypical behavior. So to have African Americans viewed in this point at this at this particular stage, but at this point um, would, would would probably be you know like a um, you know a, a dream come true for for most black writers at that time. 
and and very little other opportunity to do that within right. the very narrow lane that Hollywood you know ran around when it, when you talk about racial issues. Right? Yeah, I mean, I don't think you know you said you said it was a natural choice yeah. or a logical choice is right. what you said. You said right. it was a logical choice, and it certainly was. But if you really think about it, considering how many African American writers were there in Hollywood in the right. '30s and the '40s that you've yeah. heard of, right? Yeah. No, you. That's <laughs> a great and point. To my understanding, yeah. he was kind of yeah. excluded from an after and was making like educational films and stuff like that. But he would hire um, young black uh, filmmakers, which you know, even the films that he was making. So like, even after that fact, at the time, he was still he was still a pioneer, even though people might not remember him for it, films other than this. But he was working with people who were usually excluded from the Hollywood machine. So now, there, there were were a whole line of so-called Negro films in Hollywood at the time that you know they weren't made in Studio A, and they weren't highly budgeted. Um, but they, they were they were devoted solely for African American audiences and really not aimed at at whites at all. They were usually seen as kind of inferior product even by their African American audiences. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of this film. It does have high production values. Oh sure, it's mm-hmm. got animation, it's got narration, it has quick cuts. You know, Copper was a a genius of, uh, on this sort of thing. It's got his uh, sentimental appeal. You know, he liked to say his own style was Capricorn. Right, was, mm-hmm. he had a corny <laughs> style. He was proud of it. That was what he thought right. American audiences of all sorts. It's really responded to, but it's, so it's also you got a, you got a good writer. He's got some strong feelings. You put some money behind it. You know, military spending, right? This is, sure. this is officially military mm-hmm. spending. The, the 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 there was no ceiling to military spending during World War II, and you get a pretty good product that that reads well, that watches well, and that you know that that, that has some real quality behind it. No, I don't I don't think that's even debatable. I mean, you, you look at the product that, that you get out of the film, and as you said, it's it's high high quality production. And Frank Capra, he he did. There wasn't anything he did, you know, half baked or half cocked. He did everything to the nth degree. Hence, the reason for why we fight this one, why it's so dang long. That's why it took him so long to produce it because he wanted to put everything he had into it. And the same thing goes with this, and and really, again, everything that the man ever did. But it was, um, it, it's a product of its times, but it's also it's a very good product of its times, which I think is hard to say about any other film that's going to feature African Americans until the '60s. Really, uh, prominently, I should say, as a major character or a major subject, as this is a subject, not necessarily a character, but until, you know, late 60s, really late 60s. So um, the film mentions there are those, quote, this is a quote from the film. Film mentions there are those who would say that Japan is the savior of the colored races, end quote. What does this mean? <laughs> well, I right. can tell you what it means, but go ahead, Marcus. Right, right. yeah. Well, um, and, uh, one of the books that I've used in my classes uh, um, was uh, War Without Mercy that John talked Dower. about Wonderful John Dower, book. exactly, yeah. um, about how World War II, especially in the Pacific, was was more was almost really like a, a race war. Yeah. When you look at how uh, Japanese were characterized as monkeys, when you look at how American um, soldiers and Americans were characterized by the Japanese as brutes and all these sort of things. But um, when you look very closely at the history between um, African Americans and Japan, certainly going back to the 1930s, um, there was sort of, uh, um, I guess, uh, um, overtures made by the by the Japanese government to sort of make connections with black leaders, in particular the Nation of Islam, um, and um, and the Nation of Islam and, and many um, African American leaders, not many, I would say, a very small number um, that were against the war and were were against. Um, um, uh, African American participation for a lot of different reasons um, tended to um, publicly, you know, support Japan in in in, in the in, in the war um, with the intent of Japan sort of. Um, uh, um, treating African Americans better than, than white Americans um, historically. And so, um, uh, as a matter of fact, Elijah Muhammad from the Nation of Islam, I think, was arrested in 1944, maybe 45, uh, for, for uh, seditious behavior um, and, um, and publicly stating that he wanted Japan to win. Um, and so, um, uh, I think, you know, again, the majority of African Americans are probably not aware of any of these things. Um, but there, there was sort of a belief by the federal government um, that that th- this belief could sort of um, have traction in the black community. And so I, th- I, w- I think that that's why that statement was sort of made, that um, there are some that believe that, you know, that, um, that Japan is, is going to be the savior of, of, of all the races. 
So, um, actually, Marcus, that's fascinating. I had no idea about the re- the relationship between the nation and the and and yeah. and the Japanese or that Elijah Muhammad made made those statements. You know, one of the big parts of Japanese propaganda in World War II, their battle in the Pacific, was was not against folks who lived in Asia, but it's against the white empires in Asia. Mm-hmm. So ABCD. the British and, and the, the French. The greater East and, and Asian co-prosperity the, sphere. Very good, Chris. <laughs> Say that 10 times. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> um, but, so, you know, that was the – Japanese were saying Asia for the Asians, and, and they, were, they, they were saying that there's no reason, there's no intrinsic reason that a white person is superior to anyone who lives in Asia. So it was a big part of their propaganda. I just was unaware that they attempted to, to exploit that propaganda in the United States as well. That's fascinating. A- Asia for the Asians, unless you were not Japanese. Yes, I mean, that's it was, yeah. abundantly clear. Here. Of course, it, it was a it was a myth, and it was it just it 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 attempted to disguise naked aggression and brutal occupation policies. But it was nevertheless had some traction early in the war. And there there were there were instances, you know, I mean, and maybe that might have been the the, the popular myth as, as you just stated. But there were instances in the war and where where. Uh, Members of the 93rd Infantry Division, the, the African American unit in the Pacific, that were captured by the Japanese, and they were treated, shall we just say, less than kindly, and 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 that I mean they weren't treated any differently, frankly, than if they captured a white American or a Mexican. Right. I mean, they didn't. The Japanese didn't care, but uh, but it was it was. Not all that it was necessarily cracked up to now be. Now that's propaganda. <laughs> I, I defended propaganda earlier. Ja- Japanese coast, Greater Asia, East Asian Coast Prosperity Story. I can't even say it. Yeah, and that's, that's propaganda. That is a tongue twister, as, if there ever was one. But um, Rob, I know you want to talk about this. The film mentions the Joe Lewis versus Max Schmeling boxing match, which was incredibly famous before the war, and then of course you know throughout. Uh, what is the significance of this? Which I'm again. I think it's pretty obvious, but right. but go so, ahead. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. yeah, I love this. This to me is the greatest part of the film. So Joe Lewis, uh, great uh, African American boxer, and Max Schmeling, a hero of Nazi Germany, also a great boxer. They fought twice. They fought in 1936, and they fought in 1938, uh, uh, 39. I think the second uh, match was. Um, well, the first time Schmeling beat Lewis up to that time, I was the only person who'd ever beaten Lewis. And the second time that Lewis got Schmeling in the Ooh, ring, he got him. <laughs> he tore him apart <laughs> yeah. in one minute, 49 seconds. Apparently, that's when Schmeling's uh, manager threw in the towel. Officially, it went, the bot, the bot, bot went a little longer than that. But, you know, let me say this. I've, I've been making a case that this movie puts uh, African-Americans into the mainstream, into the middle class. But in the case of Joe Lewis, it turns an African-American, maybe for the first time in American history, I, I, it's always tough to say that, into an honest-to-God, red-blooded American hero standing up for everything that America uh, stands for, equality of all, e- e- equality even between the races, whether the law says it or not, you feel it in your heart. And there's Lewis standing up and, and you know, I, I know there's a, f- a few words we're not allowed to say, so beating the something out of, out of, out of a Nazi that. who <laughs> stands for a, a state which has, you know, official obnoxious racial policies and will eventually carry out a policy of racial extermination. Joe Lewis, American hero. And that's that's what I, I really like that about this that's film. That's peak and, propaganda of this film. It is and, a recruiting tool, but that's where the propaganda comes peak, in. You're like, go get him. Peak. Go get him, Joe. You and, know? and that so, footage, I, I yeah. urge everyone out there to look at the footage wherever yeah. you can find watch it all this, over the internet. And then, yeah, it's on YouTube. And uh, then watch the footage. <laughs> uh, and it's a minute and 49 yeah. of total, utter mayhem. Yeah. Joe, Joe Lewis was a popular guy amongst all Americans, though. Because boxing's always been a well, fairly popular sport, but especially back then, it was it was more popular then than it is now. And and Joe Lewis was a well respected African American or not, he was a well respected sports hero amongst American citizenry for for good reason. I mean, the, he was a bad man. <laughs> he he was a bad dude. But then too, you know, they focus on Jesse Owens, who was another really household name. Yeah. He was an African American. Obviously, he was a gold medalist in the '36 Olympics. I don't need to tell most people this, but but he was another household name. And I think, personally, my opinion, why they showed Joe and 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 Jesse is because it was something that would immediately ring with white audiences. Right. They knew who Joe Lewis was. They knew who Jesse Owens was, and they're like, oh yeah, those guys. Yeah, they are pretty cool. They're good. All right, let them in. That kind of thing. I, I think personally, that's why it was there. And there, of course, were ulterior motives too. And saying that red-blooded American pounding the living bejesus out of out of a out Nazi of, out of the Falschinger yeah, or right. future Falschinger out, out of a Nazi paratrooper. <laughs> and, and I think that also again, when we look at the you know the purpose of of the documentary was to as a recruiting tool, and then also to to gain um, more support in the black community. 
Jesse Owens and and Joe Lewis are at the I mean they're at the pinnacle of being popular, successful. Um, um, but what they demonstrate is you have two African Americans who beat Germans. You know now granted it was it wasn't on the battlefield, but they beat them while the Germans were at their best. Handle it. So, too, so, yeah. so sim- symbolically, I think it represents that African Americans can also join the military and beat the Germans. You know, so um, they're not Superman. Right. The Germans are not Superman, right. despite their ridiculous claims or the right. claims of their Fuhrer. And the other thing I think is so interesting here is they talk about like the Nazi racial policies, you know, or that's what we're inferring. But like right. we can't talk about all of the racial tensions in the right. United States, right. but we can call out the Nazis. It's like, oh, that moment is so fascinating of that film. It's like yeah. we'll talk about race, but if I not may, here. If I may quote you know? one of the founders of the National World War II Museum, Stephen Ambrose, who said we fought the greatest racist in history with a segregated army. You know, he called yeah. out the uh, he called out the irony a long time ago. So I, I th- you're so right. And there are times you want to stand up and you want to stand know? up and speak to the screen. Say, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that Meanwhile. goes back to what we talked about in the beginning is what, what was left out of the film. And while you're you're banging on the, the, the Nazi racial theories or, 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 you know, Joe Lewis pounding on Max Schmeling and Jesse Owens smoking everybody there in the Olympics, it, it's it's also not calling into the play. Oh, and so, well, you can't use the same bathroom that I can because just because that's and, what and we And even more than that, I think w- one of the things that really resonated with me is when I watched the, the, the documentary and I saw, of course, when they're showing the Germans, obviously, with all the... The, the atrocities and they're showing um, men and women being hung um, and um, I'm assuming it's in the East, Eastern Europe yeah, or something. Uh, Soviet Union I figured, right yeah. um, but then again at this particular time African Americans are still being lynched in the South right you, you know so, so <laughs> and 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 um, you know, so I, I'm, you know, I immediately saw again the symbolism with that. You know, but but again, and that's why I really asked my students, what is the what the documentary not saying? You know, um, and um, be, because there 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 is um, a, a little level of, of hypocrisy. You know, with with the way the Germans are depicted and what's happening with race relations in, in the United States at that time. So, um, some one of the scenes excised from the final cut. You may know this is a, a African American soldier having his back washed by a white nurse. Right. Yeah. I so we beat the Nazis. We fight the Nazis, and, and, and right. but we can't have a, a, a white nurse ministering to a black they, patient. They show like a hanging, to so people are like, okay, like. Then they make the association. Like, they obviously knew what they were doing. Like, we can get this in, right. even though we couldn't show a lynching here. I mean, right. do you think that was maybe behind the mindset of the filmmakers? or Probably not Capra's, my guess. Yeah, but, but maybe, I don't know. Just, maybe right. Moss's. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, um, you know, if I remember, you know, uh, clearly that I think women were also among the ones that were being lynched by the Nazis. And, oh, and, men, I, women and, I and I think, children, you know, yeah. one, you know, myth is that, you know, only black males were being lynched in the South. And that's not true. Women were as well, you know. But I think that it was it's not as well known, you know, even then um, ex- outside of the black community. So, um, you know. Uh, but but again, I, I thought that w- that image was very powerful, but yet yeah. it, was, it was somewhat hip- hypocritical. Yeah. I'm I'm just going to bring this up before we before we move on. You know, we keep talking about this film, The Negro Soldier. Does everybody know that there was a sequel to this, right? Or I guess you could call right. it a sequel to part two. It's called The Negro Sailor. Has anybody? Did not, oh, I actually did know not that. know that. Thank you. I did not know that. Well, well, I got next, it if you want to see it. But so okay. Our, our next podcast. Yeah. 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 It is yeah. completely completely different than this really oh yeah oh well, yeah is, it, is it, it done by capra or I, honestly yeah. i don't i don't recall I, i'd have to look it up Be but I, I, I don't yeah. remember off the top of my head if I, it doesn't look like it is yeah like stylistically it doesn't look like it is it's very high quality production piece and it's made by the war department same kind of a deal but it's different you know i don't this is again this is something you cannot argue here the united states navy without a doubt and god love the navy was I mean, I love the Navy, but I mean, it, it was without a doubt the most segregated service branch right. in the American military. Oh, yeah. I mean, without even yeah. question. And they made a film similar to this that showed African Americans that you can be a part of the United States Navy and you don't necessarily have to just serve food and shine shoes. But it was <laughs> it's much more degrading. It's not it's not a slap in the face, but it is right. not nearly as uplifting and, hey, hey you know what? I'm going to go join the Army. Right. I'm going to guess that, there, that the enlistments by African Americans in the United States Navy did not rise meteor, 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 uh, try meteorically. That Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Seth and I have a relationship. <laughs> didn't go through the roof. <laughs> As they may have increased after right. watching this, I highly recommend 
you yeah, check it out. Uh, yeah, I, check I, it I out. had no idea. That's it's, good stuff. It's really different. Wow. Really different. Um, well, let's let's wrap it up. Chrissy, I'm going to start with you. Did you like it, and would you recommend this film? Yeah, I would definitely recommend this film. I think it's a fantastic history lesson um, for you know people of all ages, but even, as I said, I like looking at it, like from today's lens, and then then taking a step back from it and really analyzing it are kind of two different experiences. So um, th- that's how I kind of experienced it with rewatching it. So I feel like, you know, I want other people to experience that. So yeah, definitely, I would recommend it. Marcus, uh, yeah, I mean, but I, I've I've used the um, the Negro Soldier in my classes, um, and I use it as a teaching tool. But is it, coincidentally, I was, I'm teaching in class right now, and I was talking to my students, and we were we were talking about the new movie that just came out called Queen and Slim. Um, and and um, and I was telling telling my students that you know movies, you know, you, you don't go to the mo- a movie to be educated. You go to be entertained. All right, I said, but there there could be educational value, and because one of the things that movies usually do is they re- they reflect the times, they reflect. Uh, um, present culture, or they reflect those sort of things. So it's a good way to really understand um, the time period. Um, now, in this sense, I wouldn't use the Negro soldier because it, it is a, is a you know, propaganda film. It is, um, uh, it, it leaves a lot out um, at, at that reflects um, what's really going on. But I think it's important because I, it, um, the outcome of the of the of the documentary was so important to the civil rights movement. It was important to the desegregation of the military. It was important um, at that particular time, even the fact that many whites throughout the United States embraced this 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 documentary. Um, so it's a watershed moment. Um, um, but I think if someone is watching this this documentary and they don't really understand what's really going on, it's not going to be as valuable. So for me, I've used it for many years and I will continue using it because I think it has that much value. Rob. So I'm just going to do what I always do at this moment of the podcast and quote Langston Hughes writing in. Actually, I don't do that enough, <laughs> but writing in The Defender, Langston Hughes said the War Department has just shown to the press the most remarkable Negro film ever flashed on the American screen. It is distinctly and thrillingly worthwhile. So despite its omissions and its, its, its distortions and despite the fact that it's of its time, I like what Marcus just said. It's an absolute watershed moment. It's an important film. Yeah, I, I agree with everybody here. I mean, I, I think, you know, it, what Langston Hughes just said there in, in Rob's voice is, is that uh, <laughs> Langston Satino over here. Oh, I love that. Thank <laughs> that, you. What an, what that, an that, that, it is, that it is important because nothing like this had ever been done to, to this degree. You know, for African-Americans. And yes, I firmly believe it had ulterior motives. I don't think any of us here disagree with that. But it it definitely is important. It's an important film for that time. It's an important film for this time, too. It is a product of its times, for sure. And you have to take that into agree, uh, in, into account when you watch it. But it's a, re- it's a really good film, considering that it is only 42, 42 and minutes, change I think, yeah. long for a documentary. And that's, you know, that's about, that's about good for a documentary. But it is good, and you should definitely check it out. Um, Rob, can you sum it up in a, in a sentence or so? Yeah. I think the Negro soldier tells a, a certain level of truth. Marcus? I think educationally it's very valuable. Um, and um, it, 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 it had a greater impact, I think, in the future than at that particular time. Mm-hmm. Chrissy? So listen to this podcast for the context, watch the movie, and then after that, watch Joe Lewis's fight. With Marshall <laughs> yeah. All minute and 40 some odd yeah. seconds. And you can do all that, you know, in a couple hours. So. <laughs> the best minute yeah. 49 yeah. of your life. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it, uh, yeah, I'll just sum it up and say that it is a very important film. It was an important film at its time. It's an important film today. And it's it's worth the 42 minutes and change of your time. Uh, it's available on Amazon so, for free. So check it out. And um I don't think you'll be disappointed. I think you'll be inspired, frankly. And with that, I want to thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to hear more about the events we discussed today, tune into our mini episode next week. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Service on Celluloid. Be sure to rate and review us on Stitcher and iTunes if you like what you hear. I'd like to thank everyone who made this podcast possible, our producer, Mallory Kirk, and our sound engineer, Jeremy Burson. This (laughs) This has been a production of the National World War II Museum.